Then Agrippa said to Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Verse number two grabbed me and I've not been able to let go of it. Oh, I've read this and you have too. But look what it says right there. I think myself happy. <laughs> I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all these things whereof I am accused of the Jews. And we can go on and read about Paul's uh, defense before, uh, before Agrippa right there, but that's not the point that I want to preach about this morning for a few minutes because I know this and you know this. All of us go through times uh, of discouragement or disappointment or failure or a storm, uh, whatever label you want to put on it. Uh, we go through situations. Once you find Paul here as he stands before Agrippa, if you know anything about the story of Acts, Paul is under arrest. He has been taken into custody because of his uh, faith in the Lord Jesus and his ministry. The, uh, and so he's been taken uh, into, uh, into custody, and the uh, Jews are there of the Sanhedrin, the, the, the ruling council of the Jews, and they are trying to explain to King Agrippa why he ought to deliver Paul into their hands so that they can kill him for blaspheming, as they think, their faith. And so Agrippa says to Paul, you can speak for yourself. We've heard the charges what do you have to say? And I like two things about this because it says, first of all, Paul stretched forth his hand. I'm glad as a hand talker that Paul was too. He talked with his hands. He stretched forth his hand and began to talk. So those of you who couldn't talk if your hands were tied behind your back like me, uh, you, you can appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, y'all were looking kind of serious, so I was trying to be a little bit funny there. But it's the truth. It's what the Word says. He stretched forth his hand and explained to them. Uh, so, But the second thing is, have you ever really paid attention to how he starts his defense? I think myself happy. I think myself happy. And so uh, that is what the Holy Spirit just, you know, I'm like struggling to, to want to get out of bed uh, in the morning and, and my dreams are troubled when I do go to sleep and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just struggling uh, through this uh, experience and I read that I think myself happy and, and it's like, hello, you know, hello, the Lord says, hello, you know, and, and so uh, I understand that, uh, that this is the message for us today. Let's pray. Father, we're coming to hear the preaching of the word. Let there be that same kind of aha moment like I had. God, let this do the same kind of work in others. And God, maybe in this room there are some who need this aha moment, this, this life moment empowering moment right now, but for the rest of us, we need to fold this up and put it in our, uh, in our pocket and be able to take it out when that disappointing phone call comes or when that bad news comes, when the, wh when the struggle comes, that we can pull this out and think back on these thoughts and encourage ourselves in the Lord uh, so that we can continue to be overcomers for Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, I realize, uh, you know, I, I, that uh, proper interpretation of this passage of Scripture says all this is is Paul's introduction to his sermon or to his defense of himself. And really, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to be all uh, in, in proper interpretive uh, position here. Paul is basically, in our terminology, he would be saying, thank you, King Agrippa, for letting me speak for myself, okay? And he's saying, I'm glad to be doing this in front of you, you know, I know that you're a fair judge. But 
folks, I don't know what any other, I don't know what the, what the nearly inspired version or the, uh, or the English standard or any of those other versions. I'm saying that with a smile on my face. I'm trying to get y'all to, to laugh a little bit this morning. Uh, but uh, I don't know what any other version other than the King James interprets that. I didn't consult with any others because that's what arrested me and, I, and stopped me in my tracks was the wording that the interpreters put right there. I think myself happy because I believe that right there is a principle that I can back up from elsewhere in the New Testament that says, and the Old Testament, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I think because Paul didn't have to say, I think myself happy. He could have said, come across and up from the other viewpoint. I'm mad today. I'm angry. I'm upset because all this has been done to me and I don't deserve it. But I think myself happy, King Agrippa, that I get to stand before you today. You see, this was the same Paul who'd been already in prison for two years on this. It didn't happen yesterday. He'd been locked up for doing nothing but preaching Jesus. He'd been locked up for two years before he stands in front of Agrippa. Do you understand that the last administration just left him in jail because they didn't want to do anything that would upset the Jews, so they just left him in jail. Also, the scripture says Felix was hoping that Paul would slip him some money. He was waiting for a bribe. The Bible says that. He was hoping for a bribe. And so he'd bring Paul out and let him talk to him every once in a while and then put him back in jail hoping for a bribe and at the same time knowing, well, I'm keeping those Jews happy that Paul's not on the streets. So now the administration has changed. And now here's Agrippa. And two years have gone by, and yet he could still say, I think myself happy. I want to ask you a question that's very pointed. Maybe two hours have gone by since your bad news. Maybe two days, two weeks, two months. Can you still say, I think myself happy? Maybe it's been a long time since you got that diagnosis of that disease or since you lost that job or since that relationship broke up, since the divorce, since the bankruptcy, since whatever your bad news was. Can you, like the Apostle Paul, say, I think myself happy today? Or are you still letting that arrest in Paul's case, that event in your life that happened two minutes ago, two days, two, however long ago it was in your past, are you still letting that ruin your today and your, your attitude and emotional state today? You don't have to. You can let go of that in Jesus' name, and the Holy Spirit can relieve you of that in Jesus' name if you will give it to him. I'm telling you, it works. Uh, this was the same Paul who'd been beaten five times by the Jews before this. This was him who had been beaten with whips and beaten with rods and, and stoned. This was the same guy, and he could say, I think myself happy. Paul didn't have an easy time serving Jesus. I bet you his life, if he wanted to give a testimony from what I know about the Apostle Paul, it seems like his life was much easier before he met Jesus. Because you don't read about any difficulties or any problems. Paul was a rising star in, in, uh, in Jerusalem on the, the, the religious scene, which was also their political scene because the Sanhedrin, the, the, the council of Jewish elders, ran things both culturally and, and, and through their religion and through their politics. And Paul was a rising star. He had been to the best college, sitting at the feet of their number one teacher, Gamaliel. And Paul was from a wealthy family, obviously. And Paul had all the advantages, plus he was zealous for the religion. He was a, he was a rising star. No doubt soon, as he was eligible, old enough, able, he would have been on that Sanhedrin council and, and, uh, and one of the chief rulers. You don't read anything about problems, and then he met Jesus. <laughs> and then all the problems started. Can I just tell you something, follower of God? That's exactly the same story we have, <laughs> that the problems come as a result of our following God because... Why? Because we have an adversary, Peter says, uh, that roams around seeking whom he may devour. And why should he go after old Joe that never darkens the door of a church and doesn't profess to know Jesus as his Savior and is just living life for the devil anyway? Uh, that, you know, Joe's already in the devil's back pocket, so he's going to go after those whom he may devour. 
seeking to kill and to steal and destroy what God is trying to do in this world. So Paul had trouble, but yet he still said, I think myself happy. Think about this is the Paul who gets taken off the street, whipped and thrown in the jail at Philippi, in the innermost jail. Not only did he get beaten on the back, but they locked Paul and Silas hands and feet in stocks while they're in the innermost prison, and there they got in a big pity party all night, and all they did was moan and complain. <laughs> That's not what the story says, is it? It says, sometime in the nighttime, Paul and Silas began to sing praises unto God. They sang in the midnight hour. Long about midnight, Paul began to sing. Silas started to pray. <laughs> now, what happened? The doors began to shake. The foundations of the prison were shaken, and the doors came open. And everybody got set free. Nobody ran off. And Paul saw the jailer and his household. And I want to thank a number of those prisoners who gave their life to Jesus because he thought himself happy in a jail cell in Philippi when he hadn't done anything wrong and found himself in a terrible situation and still could think himself happy. What a challenge to me, what a challenge to you that whatever happens, we've got to think ourselves happy in the Lord because, you know, you may have lost everything. You may have had an unexpected loss that you just simply don't see how you're going to recover from, but Jesus is still Jesus. God is still God, and the Word is still true, and every promise is yea and amen. amen. What does that mean in English? If God said it, He's going to do it. If God said it, He's going to do it. So let me just ask you, I think myself happy. What is happiness? When I was preparing this part of the sermon, I thought about something that I haven't seen in a long time, but it was quite faddish for a while there a number of years ago to have this fake plastic bass that went up on the wall. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? And there was a button you could push on that thing, and it would start singing, Don't worry, be happy, you know. Yeah. When I was younger than that, it, that uh, Bobby McFerrin came out with, uh, with that song uh, back uh, late 80s, I guess, early 90s came out, and I'm sure that's not the first time that it was released, but Bobby McFerrin was one, that guy that did the singing and all the music and everything with his, with his voice, and he came out with that, Don't, there's a little song I wrote. You don't have to sing it note for note, but don't worry. Y'all remember those of you that are old as me, uh, you remember, all right? Well, you know, that's kind of a fun little song, and it's catchy, and it's easy to sing, but it's, you know, but friend, let me tell you, it's terrible advice. What do you mean, preacher? You're not going to be happy all the time because happiness depends on circumstances. Well, you're just preaching about how Paul said, I think myself happy. Oh, yeah. But what I'm trying to tell you, happiness depends on what happens. If you're having a good day, you're happy. If somebody gives you a handshake after church and puts money in your hand, you're happy, you know. If everybody just leaves and doesn't talk to you, you're not happy, <laughs> right? If you go to the restaurant and your food is good and your service is good, you're happy. If you go and you're on a 45-minute wait and then your server is bad and then the food is cold, you're not happy, you know, uh, right? So uh, uh, the happiness depends on circumstances. If you put your trust in what makes you happy, then you're going to be a victim of circumstances, but you see, God never changes. So we've got to put our hope in God. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us to rejoice in circumstances. What do you mean? The Bible doesn't, does not say rejoice in circumstances. Because if it did, that would mean when everybody's nice to me and I'm having a good day, well, I'm going to praise God and I'm going to rejoice. And when everybody's mean to me and I'm not having a good day, I'm going to not rejoice and I'm going to feel sorry for myself and stick my bottom lip out. But the Bible says rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord 
in spite of your circumstances. When I feel good, I rejoice. When I feel bad, I rejoice. When I'm having a good day, I need to rejoice. When I'm having a bad day, I need to rejoice because regardless of all of that other stuff, God's still God and God's still good and I'm going to be all right at the end of this thing. It's going to be okay. Everything that's really important is taken care of. It's going to be all right. God isn't moved by my circumstances. It better not be, child of God, it better not be the things of this world that makes you happy. <laughs> Why? Because they're fleeting and they're changing. That f I've, I've heard it said and read it too many times in quotes from the rich and famous that that first million, not quite enough. We need another one. You know, that, that first trillion, we gotta, gotta keep making more, gotta keep, gotta keep growing. There's not quite enough, we gotta keep investing. And the funny thing about wealth is there's an old Chinese proverb that, that proves pretty well true, the wealth of one generation is squandered by the third generation. And so, you know, uh, just look at uh, uh, the, the Hilton Hotel brand, the way that the Hilton Hotel brand grew up was out of the Great Depression, and uh, <clears throat> and the, the founder of Hilton Hotels he gave he gave to church and he gave to charity quite liberally, and he was blessed. And Hilton Hotels are worldwide one of the biggest names. His son that took over. <clears throat> already living comfortably on what dad had built, said, I will give at least 90% of my, of my salary to charity. And that was the principle he lived by, I believe, was the second generation Conrad Hilton, or was that the first? Anyway, doesn't matter. The third generation had people like Paris Hilton, who if you know anything about Paris Hilton, is only famous for being famous and lives her life spending all the money that daddy and granddaddy made on extravagance and, and, and so that, that's what I'm talking about, you know? Uh, and, and you've seen, you, you know of that which I speak. So wealth isn't what's gonna bring you happiness. Some people crave power, other people crave pleasure, but those things all change and they're not lasting. Nothing in this world satisfies. That's because God created us that way. He created us with a space in our heart that only God can fill. Money can't fill it. Power, prestige, friends, alcohol, drugs, nothing can fill it except Jesus. Only Jesus can make us whole and can fill that spot. Well, Pastor, I just don't know about that. I, I sh uh, you say money can't m make anybody happy, but I sure believe I'd be happier than I am now if I just had enough money in the bank to not worry about it. Well, do we have time? Ooh. I was going to take you to Ecclesiastes, chapter number one, and walk through this with you. Write it down. <clears throat> if you think that there's anything in the world that can make somebody happy, the wisest man who ever lived would surely have been a happy man. And as you read through Ecclesiastes, you'll find that the wisest man, you see Solomon, the Bible says he was the wisest and wealthiest man ever. You know, they were, yeah. The house wasn't just imitation gold on the wall, it was the real deal, you know. Uh, that incredibly wealthy was Jerusalem and Israel at that time. But he said, all is vanity. That's what this man said. Well, surely he didn't try. What does vanity mean, preacher? It means it's all disappointing. It's all just misery. Everything just vexes my soul and disappoints me. There's no lasting pleasure in any of it. Well, what did he try? Well, chapter 1 says he tried wisdom and knowledge, but he found it to be vanity and, and didn't last. So he tried in chapter 2, verse number 3. He said, I gave myself to strong drink and wine, and I found that that only left me saying vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So he turned his attention to business, and he built his business, and he became a success in business. And he says, vanity, 
vanity. So he said, I'll just increase my wealth. And so he built big storehouses and he laid up wealth and he became even more wealthy and success and he had more gold. It says that they didn't even count the silver because it was just so commonplace in Solomon's kingdom. Wealthiest man ever. And what did he say about all that money? Vanity. Vanity. It's just vanity. It doesn't satisfy. So he turned his attention to relationships. In chapter 2, verse 10 says, He did not withhold himself from anything that gave him pleasure. And yet by chapter 7, he says, I hate life. He had all the money you can imagine, all the wealth, all the power, all the success, all the women. You know, these uh, nuts from this other religion that think they're going to blow themselves up and get all these virgins when they get to paradise. Uh, Solomon had hundreds of women, and he said, I hate my life, you know. Uh, it's not found in relationships, this pleasure. I never would say this. I would never say it. But I heard a preacher one time say, why did Solomon have uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines? Why did he have that many? Because he wanted to come home from work and find at least one woman in a good mood. <laughs> well, I would never say that. <laughs> never. I love you ladies, and I appreciate y'all very much. I would never say that. Nope. So you can see why he said, I despair of my life. Nothing. Why? Because as a young man, when he was under David's tutelage and when he was just beginning to take the, 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 uh, the, the throne, his heart was on God. His heart was on his relationship with Jesus. But then his heart went after every other thing. His Every other thing in his relationship with God was not where it was supposed to be at the top priority. He incorporated all this other, and when he did, instead of focusing on God and him first, seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, then everything just became vanity. Why do I save up all this money? Why have I planted all these orchards and, and made all this and gotten all this and built up the city? I'm just going to die, and I can't take any of it with me anyway. And then somebody else who didn't do any work is just going to inherit it all. And that's in Ecclesiastes. If you've never read it, read it. Why'd they include that in the Bible? Ecclesiastes is part of the wisdom literature of the Bible. It is to show you the utter foolishness of a life that is turned into a, into a, 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 a direction that is apart from God. That's why Ecclesiastes is there, to tell you nothing satisfies, nothing satisfies except with Jesus. Norman Vincent Peale, uh, the, the founder of Guidepost magazine, a great, uh, you know, a, a preacher in New York in, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, Norman Vincent Peale writes about uh, an encounter where he had a businessman that he was talking to, and this businessman said, Preacher, I would gladly give you $1,000 if you could just show me and take me somewhere where people have no worries and no troubles. I just don't believe it exists. And then he began to tell Norman Vincent Peale about the trouble he had at work and the trouble he had at home and the trouble in social life and all the troubles and all the problems. So Pill let him out of his office and they caught a taxi cab and he says, I, I can take you someplace and I can take you and show you someplace where people have no trouble. You've probably heard this story. It's pretty famous. They got in a taxi cab and they drove across New York and they got out of a taxi cab right in front of a cemetery. And Norman Vincent Peale said to the businessman, the people here are the only ones in this world that don't have trouble. And then he asked the man, is that where you want to be? To which he said, no, I'm not ready to die. And so Norman Vincent Peale said, then thank God you're alive and accept your troubles as a part of life and God will give you the strength to rise above the trouble if you depend on him. Amen. Okay, now there's some things about Norman Vincent Peale and his, uh, you know, the power of positive thinking that are a little bit troubling. 
But that right there is great advice for all of us. Depend on God and he'll give you the strength to rise above your troubles. And one of these days when we're ready, when he's ready, we're going to go to a place where there's no more trouble anymore. But in the meantime, he says, don't lose hope because I've overcome this world already, right? That, that's what he told us. So what we have to do is master our thoughts. That's the lesson that God told me, uh, you know, uh, this week, earlier in the week when he began to deal with me about this sermon, is we've got to master our thoughts. Amen. Uh, let me just tell you something. Here as Americans, I don't know what your exact problem or struggle or difficulty that troubles you at night when you get ready to go to bed or makes it, you know, uh, the, the, that worries you or concerns you when you get quiet. But as Americans, we are some of the most blessed people on the face of the earth just by being Americans, just by being here. Can I tell you that uh, one of the things, here, here's just a few things that I can, can tell you about the blessings of living where we live. Life expectancy of Americans has increased over the last few decades to, to the longest you know, uh, in, in uh, well, since Bible times, uh, the average per capita income in America has increased. Now, the last few years, it's kind of grown stagnant, but if you go back, you know, we're living lives of affluence that our great-grandparents would never have imagined. Well, I don't have very much money. Oh, yeah, but think back to the way, you know, the Depression and, and even beyond that back into when your grandparents lived or your great-grandparents, you know, yeah, we've got three cars in the garage and we've got, you know, air conditioning and heating and lights and, and running water that we don't have to go pump up from the well. Yeah, just, just that. We're li Yet, with the affluence that America has, there are more people seeking help from psychologists and psychiatrists for depression than ever before. Well, it's because there's more people than ever before. No, I'm talking about the percentage of the population, not just the number of people, but the percentage of the population that are seeking help. Now, folks, I am not in any way saying that, that uh, uh, you know, that people are wrong for seeking help and treatment when they have depression. That's not my message. What I'm telling you is the rise in longevity and in affluence and in wealth and in comforts and, and pastimes and activities that are going on out there and, and all of that that has increased, people are more depressed and discouraged than ever before. All of that social media, all of the movies, all of the 200 TV channels you can have pumped into your living room by satellite dish, all of that stuff, man, you can drive down this street and find any flavor of church that you want to go worship at just here on Airport Road, regardless of what else is around town. You can go Greek Orthodox if you want to. You can go, you know, all kinds of things that are here available in Hot Springs. You can eat at every kind of restaurant from a McDonald's to a four-star fine dining here in this town. Yet people are discouraged and depressed and looking for something. Folks, I'm trying to tell you one little thing right now. Have you ever heard the saying, I cried because I had no shoes until I saw a man that had no feet? We get to thinking, oh, woe is me, and I just don't have what everybody else has. Thank God for what we do have and for the blessings that we do have. I am proud to be an American. I'm proud to be living in here. I'm glad to be in Arkansas. I'm glad to be at Lake Hamilton Assembly of God around you folks. I am glad, and if everything else were diminished, praise God, I am saved. I'm saved, and I know that I am. So what's the secret, Pastor? The secret is contentment. Amen. But godliness with contentment is great gain, the Bible says. For we brought nothing into this world, and we will take nothing out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, be content with that. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So Paul had a choice. He chose to be positive. Hmm. 
Paul could certainly have focused on the negatives. I've admitted to you before, and I'll say it again, it's easy for me and my personality to focus on the negatives. I've got the same choice Paul did. Hey, don't just throw tomatoes at me. You have the same choice that Paul did too. Amen. With the stuff that comes in your life, you've got the choice. Two different people can look at the same set of circumstances and see completely different things. But can I tell you, that's one of the privileges of being in the family of God. Because thank God, I know that there are some of you that when I'm having a bad day, it's all right with you if I call you or text you and say, I need your prayers. I'm struggling today. And I know you won't say, I ain't going back to church there. That pastor struggles. <laughs> huh? I've known some folks, though, that think the pastor ought to be up there where he's not having a hard time at all. Hey, I'm just a man like you are, and I struggle sometimes, and I thank God there are some of you that will pray for your pastor when I ask you to, and, 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 and so thank God uh, uh, for that, and I do appreciate it. Amen. But I, that's one of the privileges of being in a church family is that when I'm down, somebody in this church, if not several somebodies, are going to be up and be able to help me to get back up again. And when you're down, me and some of the others are going to be able to pull you back up because two people looking at the exact same circumstances can see something from a totally different perspective and a totally different viewpoint. So I want to challenge you as our time is running out. I want to challenge you this morning. Uh, you can either interpret life's difficulties as meaning, well, life is just against me. And if you look at it from that point, you will assume that either God doesn't care or that God's just upset with you or that, uh, you know, or that God's not able to do anything about your situation. Any assumption that you make when you take the life is against me viewpoint is bad theology on God. Uh, because it somehow diminishes God from being the all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God that he really is. People will say things like, if God's really all-loving, why would this bad stuff happen to me? I want to challenge you to look at it from the Christian viewpoint, from the second viewpoint, where we see a God who is fully in control, who is all-good and all-powerful, and in his infinite wisdom... He allows us to go through difficulties because he knows they will ultimately work a greater good. you got to trust God that he knows what he's doing. And when he allows you to go through difficulties, maybe he's teaching you the lesson of making better choices, and it'll be greater good because you'll make more informed choices. You'll trust him in the future more. There are lessons to learn from our mistakes. Maybe the lesson is that he's trying to increase your faith. But whatever it may be, what I'm trying to say is some things you bring about, I bring about because of our own choices. We made a bad choice. God will use that to teach you. Some things happen just like Paul. We're being good, we're doing good, and bam, the hammer falls, and, and bad, what looks bad happens. If Paul hadn't gone through what he went through, all these rulers and leaders that he got to testify one-on-one -on -one to their face, including Caesar himself, to testify about Jesus, he wouldn't have gotten that opportunity. Plus, many of the books of our New Testament might not have been written because where did Paul write them from? A jail cell. <laughs> so greater good came because Paul was willing to go through and still say, I think myself happy. <laughs> so the battle is in our minds. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. From Proverbs 23 and 7. So what's the definition then, pastor, of an overcomer? A person who triumphs and overcomes with the help of God, whatever the circumstances. That's my definition. We overcome with God's help regardless. You might think an overcomer just walks from mountaintop to mountaintop, you know, never has to go down in the valley, never has to swim across 
flooded rivers and, and fight through jungles and, and lose his way in the darkness of the night. Just steps from mountain to mountain, but everybody I know goes from mountaintop to mountaintop by way of the deep, dark valley, and we all struggle between mountaintops. We all fight, we all grow, we all learn from mountaintop to mountaintop. Even Jesus, when they went on top of the mountain and Jesus was transfigured, they saw him shining in his glory, and they heard uh, from, uh, you know, from, from, uh, from, from, uh, from God himself. When it was over, Jesus said, come on, we've got to go back down. And as soon as they got down there, there was that man whose son had a demon, and the other disciples that had stayed behind couldn't help him, and Jesus had to come right down and face a problem as soon as he came off the mountaintop meeting with, with, with Father. <laughs> Hello! That's there for a reason. It's there telling you you're on the mountaintop in church and we had a good time and you're going to go right out there and face the devil when you walk out. And no, don't look at the person that's riding in the car with you. That's not who I'm talking about. <laughs> no, don't do it. So Paul says, take every thought captive to make it obey Christ. Amen. That is the summation of what I'm trying to preach to you this morning. Disappointing things happen. People leave your life. Some people are only there for a season. Some people are there for a lifetime. Some are there for a season. And when those seasons change and people leave our life, we've got to just let them go and give it to God. I hate it. As a pastor, I hate it. Because the heart that I have says, I want all of these sheep and a whole bunch more sheep, and it hurts my heart when somebody goes. And I struggle with that. I don't want God to change that part of me that makes it hurt when somebody leaves. Because I don't think I could be an effective pastor if I didn't have... But what I have to learn is even in those situations to continue to think myself happy. It does not mean we have failed it does not mean we were wrong. It's just a season. It's just a season, and we go on, and we move forward, and God is the giver of good. So the jobs that change, the relationships that break down, the health problems that come, we've got to all look at that as just being God is in charge, and he's going to do what's best and what's right, and I'll trust you in this season like I did in the last season, and I'll know that this season isn't going to stay forever either. It's going to change again here in a day or two or a year. It's going to evolve, and it's going to change again. So we've got to take those thoughts captive. When things happen, and you want to get discouraged and you want to get depressed, what we've got to do is say, Acts 26, 2, I think myself happy because Jesus loves me, this I know. My Bible tells me so. I'm happy because I'm saved and nothing's ever going to change that. I'm happy because tomorrow God is going to provide for my needs just like he is today and just like he did yesterday. I'm happy because I am safe and secure in the Lord. And I'm telling you, you need to speak it just like I've had to do, speak it with your mouth and tell yourself, get happy. Be encouraged in the Lord. You are still a child of God. It works. It works. I'm telling you, Philippians 4, 8, and 9, as we, as we bring this to a close. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatsoever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. What does that say in Philippians 4, 8, and 9? It says, if you will take charge of the battle of your mind... Life is against me. Nobody loves me. I'll just go eat worms. Or I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a friend of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a worshiper of God. Amen. Take charge of that battle. Think about what is pure and right and noble and praiseworthy. There are things in your life that are pure and right and noble and praiseworthy. 
Think on those things. Focus on the good. It says if you'll do that, and then you'll put into practice what you've seen and heard and learned about God and the Word of God, then the end result is the God of peace will be with you. What does that mean? Why did he call him the God of peace? Because Paul is saying whether you're in jail or not, whether you're shipwrecked on a desert island or not, whether you've just been bit by a snake that's supposed to kill you or not, whatever your circumstances, you'll be at peace. And when you've got that peace of God that passes all understanding, you can say, I think myself happy as a prisoner of God, <laughs> standing here before you testifying about my faith in Jesus. So any thoughts that are depressing, those aren't from God. God doesn't give you depressing thoughts. Any thoughts that are discouraging, those aren't from God either. God's an encourager. Any thoughts that are doubts, no, that's not God. Any thoughts that are critical of others? Any thoughts that are prideful? Those aren't from God. Reject them. Impure thoughts, greedy thoughts, reject them in the name of Jesus. You've heard me say it. I picked it up from my grandpa. I hope you'll remember you may not be able to keep that bird from landing on your hat, but you don't have to let him build a nest there. Right. What does that mean? I don't understand. A thought may pop into your mind that's impure or greedy or unlovely or unholy. You don't have to let it stay there. Bring it under obedience to Jesus Christ. Take control of that. Reject it in the name of the Lord. That thought that comes in, and boy, you want to get angry and, uh, you know, and sin? Uh, no, no, in the name of the Lord. That thought that makes you want to lust? Take control of it. Don't let it have run rampant in your life. Yeah, I can take that and nobody will ever notice it, and I sure would like. Mm, take control of that thought and do what's right. <clears throat> We can in Jesus. Paul says, focus on all that is good and encouraging and what builds us up. The psalmist in Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. For he hath done great things. See, you can just get your mind on a worship song. Get your mind, I know, mine are all 40 years old, but maybe you can, you know, maybe you're more contemporary. Get your mind on a good, wholesome song, uh, you know, uh, and, and focus on it. Get your mind in the Word. Get into the Word of God and focus on that. Change what you're thinking about, and it changes your situation. So, here's what I want to wrap this up with. There's this small plane that only had about 20 or so passengers on it, and they're flying and uh, a few hours on, on a trip, and uh, during the midst of this trip, they get into an area where it's very turbulent, and the little plane's bouncing pretty, pretty bad. Well, this lady is just really having an anxiety attack. She's really getting upset. Well, there's this little boy that's sitting right there near her, and he's just playing you know, he's just going on with his playing, and boy, he just, and so finally, you know, she's about to freak out. She's about to lose it, and, and finally she just says, how can you just sit there and play like there's nothing going on when we're in all this, oh, y'all, we're so worried. And the little boy says, my daddy's the pilot. I'm not worried. <laughs> he just keeps on playing, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> Whatever you're dealing with, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, your father's the pilot. He's, he's got it. You know, you used to see quite often a bumper sticker that said, God is my co-pilot. And then I liked the one that I saw after that that said, if God's your co-pilot, switch seats. <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to let him be in charge. And if he's in charge, then when people leave 
when, when situations hurt us, when, when we get the bad call, the bad diagnosis, the lost job, whatever, we know that the Father is still flying the plane. Amen. And we can trust that we're going to make it through this storm, make it through this cloud, make it through this time, and we're going to be all right on the other side. We can handle the turbulence. Regardless of our situation, God has it under control. Amen. So let me tell you, all things, all things work together for your good, child of God. Amen. All things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. What is that saying? We're going to have some disappointing times. We're going to have some bad days. We're going to have some hurts. But at the end of the day, for the child of God, it all works out according to his purpose. And his purposes are good. So maybe this has been cathartic for me <laughs> to walk you through the process that I've been through. But I don't believe this is just for me. I believe it's for some of you today, and I believe it's for the rest of you tomorrow or the day after that when, when something happens that takes the wind out of your sails that you didn't see coming and, and you find hurtful or painful or discouraging. So will you stand with me across the room this morning? We're going to be dismissed uh, today. Thank you for being